Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Candidates on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Linda Cohn with the League of Women Voters, and tonight we're going to explore a congressional race, Texas District 10. But first, let's before we start chatting with our ballot candidates, let's review a little bit about the primary election process. Texas Democrats and Texas Republicans each hold primary elections to determine who shall represent each party in each race in the November general election. Two statewide political parties, the Green Party and the Libertarian Party, will select their candidates for the November election in conventions. They do not use primary elections. Now, remember that in Texas, voters do not declare an affiliation with any party at the time of voter registration. Voters will identify themselves by appearing at the polling place of their chosen party. Please confirm your polling location before you head out. Polling locations change, and polling locations for Democrats and polling locations for Republicans can be different even within the same precinct. I don't want you to make any unnecessary trips. Now, during the early voting period, starting today, Tuesday, the 20th of February, and going through the end of February, you can vote at any Harris County early voting location. So that might be your best bet. If you're riding around town and you happen to see, it's usually candidate signs that advertise this as an early voting location, why not just drive in, go ahead, cast your ballot, and then you can be sure that you won't be in the wrong place. So remember, any Harris County voter can cast a ballot at any Harris County early voting location. If you need a list, please go to harrisvotes.com or to our website, www.lwvhouston.org. We have maps. We have all kinds of things to help you make it easy to cast a ballot on Election Day. Now, remember that when you choose your party, Democrat or Republican, you have to stick with that party through the entire ballot. And you also have to stick with that party through any runoff that may be necessary. You can't toggle back and forth between Democrats and Republicans. You pick one and you stick with it. But of course, in November, you can vote for any candidate in any race representing any political party. Remember, if no candidate gets at least 50% of the vote in this primary election, got to go to a runoff. And the runoff will be held on May 22nd. Keep your eye out for that. Many of these races have a good number of candidates, and it's widely anticipated that no one candidate will hit that 50% threshold. So keep an eye out, even after Election Day. After Election Day, you may have more work to do in the Texas primary runoffs set for May 22nd, 2018. So all candidates for Congressional District 10, Democrats and Republicans, were invited to appear, and uh, three have accepted, and we will be speaking with them one at a time and have a nice chat and get to really know one another. Our first candidate for this evening is Mike Siegel. Welcome. Howdy, Linda. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What is your background? Sure. Well, originally I'm from Oakland, California, and I uh, first came to Texas in 1999 as a teacher in the Teach for America program. 
and I trained in Houston, Texas that summer. Actually met my wife there as well. Uh, I went on to teach third grade, fifth grade, and eighth grade in the public schools. Uh, I also became very active in the teachers union and also became active in starting uh, charitable programs. I began with two nonprofit education agencies uh, providing free after school and summer programs for youth. Uh, later on I became a lawyer with the idea that I might affect more systemic social change. My parents tried to discourage me. They said being a teacher is the most important thing you could do. Were they teachers? They're actually lawyers, so <laughs> it was kind of a do as I say, not as I do thing. Yeah. But um, So I did become a lawyer. I started out civil rights law representing women who suffered discrimination in the workplace, uh, whistleblowers who suffered retaliation. I took on pro bono cases. And more recently, I was hired as a city attorney for the city of Austin. I say, tell me a little bit about you in the classroom. How old were your students? What did you tell them about civic life? Well, you know, I started out teaching third grade, which is a critical year for young people. It's the year that you're supposed to learn how to read. And um, I really loved the students in that way. Uh, although with those kids, you don't get so deep into the content. I, I feel like when I taught fifth grade, that was where we really got to talk about their role in the community. Uh, we taught a unit on change makers. We looked at United States history from the point of view of people who made great changes for positive or negative and uh, really always tried to bring to the classroom that idea that uh, you can choose your own destiny. If you really work hard and study and learn about what you're interested in, you can make a difference in the world. Yeah, what, what did you think of your students' opinions about civic life? Were they generally well informed, even though on a low end kind of level, they may not have been able to tell you all the things I tried to get in about Texas primary elections, but did they understand what elections were about? You know, I don't know if they understood elections so much, but I think they understood what society is about and uh, who holds the cards and who doesn't. Uh, I taught in, in schools where the students were very low income, and they understood that uh, they drew the short end of the stick, so to speak, and that they were facing a lot of obstacles. And so they were very aware of oppression and power and things of that nature, but they were also aware of the, the opportunities they had in the world. And I think most of the students I dealt with, um, that I worked with, they, they saw education as a way to succeed in society. What, what about their parents? Did their parents support the idea that they needed to be educated? Or did they need to just get through the day because life is kind of rough? No, I, I mean, I think every single parent I worked with wanted their students to do absolutely the best things. I mean, not all parents are equally able to support their, their children in school, but all of them looked at me as their ally, as someone that could help their, their child, their son or daughter, advance in life. Do you have a philosophy of education that you've marshaled from your years as a classroom teacher? Do you like charter schools? This may not bear directly on the work that you would do as a United States congressman, but you know, it's part of what we need to know about you. Do you like the charter school movement? Do you think that there ought to be uh, a way for parents to recoup some of the money they may spend on their children's education beyond uh, paying taxes? I don't see it that way. Uh, I see public education in, and in particular public school districts as the absolute backbone of democracy. Mm -hmm. This idea that no matter what the wealth of your parents, the privilege you may have, that if you go to school, you attend, you learn, that you have a, a chance for success. And so uh, through Teach for America, I met wonderful teachers who went on to found charter schools that are fabulous learning communities mm -hmm. where the students and parents are doing wonderfully. But the problem is in the aggregate, when you take a step back, um, when charter schools pull the most engaged students and active parents out of the school districts, who is left behind are the most disadvantaged young people. And in particular, charter schools often turn down students for behavioral reasons. Sometimes they don't have uh, the facilities or staff to teach special education students. So increasingly, the school districts themselves have the kids who have the greatest barriers to success. And so that is something we have to address uh, by increasing public school funding and putting more attention on, on strengthening the school districts themselves. So you're a fan of public schools? Definitely. I, I attended public school myself all the way up to college, and uh, my, my kids are in public school now. I see. I'm going to ask you some policy questions, and then maybe we'll, we'll shift back into philo philosophical discussions. Um, and we really have to talk about this as sad and as horrid as it is. Florida, what do you think Congress's role is in addressing gun violence, especially gun violence in the schools? 
I'm so proud of these Parkland young people who are leading the charge to fight uh, really against the National Rifle Association and the way they have distorted democracy in this country. Um, I think the role of the government is to protect us from dangerous uh, instrumentalities. If we think about cars, for example, to get a driver's license, you need to pass a written test and a performance test. You need to have insurance. You need to pass inspections. So why is it so much harder to drive a car than it is to acquire an automatic rifle? And so I think the role of the federal government is twofold. One, to take military weapons out of civilian hands. There is no reason why any of us need a, a jet or a tank in our home. And for that same reason, we don't need these weapons to fire so many bullets per second that they have nothing to do with self-defense or hunting or any recreational activity. So why do you think the, the opposition is so vigorous? You know, at the core, I would say it's two things. One, we have what uh, Dwight Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. So we have the war industries in this country that generate so much money off of weapons sales that they have a vested interest in increasing their profits. And then at the same time, we have these uh, succession of Supreme Court decisions that have allowed corporations to be determined to be people and that money is the same thing as speech. So right now, corporations can give the NRA as much money as they want, and the NRA can spend as much money as they want on essentially buying politicians. And we have a situation where we have representatives in Congress and in the Senate who have received millions upon millions of dollars over the years from the NRA and are now in no position to act on behalf of the people because they've already been bought and paid for. Do you have a feeling that um, this can change? I am an optimist by nature. Uh, that's probably why I went into education, and I think that's why I'm running for Congress right now. Uh, yes, I, I believe we have to look at short-term, mid-term, and long-term solutions. For long-term solutions, I think public education and restoring you know, the basic safety net is critical so we can have an engaged populace. In the short term, I think we need to take action to get rid of the military hardware in civilian hands and reduce the influence of money in politics. So this fans out away from gun safety, doesn't it? Certainly. I, I think it's a recurring theme, whether you're looking at the environment in the influence of fossil fuel industries and in, in making our decisions about climate change, whether you're talking about public education and all these industries that are profiting up upon the privatization of schools. Uh, so the, the influence of money in politics and money in governmental decision making is very important to me and it's something I would like to reduce. How would you regulate it? Well, there, there are many layers of it. Um, yeah. I, th I think Unfortunately, some things have to be done either at the constitutional level or the, or the Supreme Court level uh, in terms of the courts and this idea that a corporation is a person. But there's a lot that, that Congress can do to put in common sense regulations to limit the role of, of fundraising in politics and to limit the back and forth between private industry and governmental service. We have a lot of people in positions of power that for years worked in the industry they're supposed to be regulating. And so that was, that's something I would like to curtail. You've talked a lot about money in politics. Does that create a playing field that's warped? Surely. Or should people who are not well funded simply get out there and work harder and raise funding? Is it perhaps true that your funding levels are indicative of the support for your position? Well, you know, luckily uh, you can't buy people. So for as much money as the incumbent in this race might have, and apparently he's worth $300 million, uh, it is his responsibility to be a representative. And so my theory is, yes, I need to raise money, but if I can get volunteers to knock on doors, right now I have 100 volunteers in my campaign, that that can be an equalizing factor. Certainly I need money to pay for print materials and, mm -hmm. and certain types of advertisements and staffing and so forth, but there's a lot you can do with people power. Okay. Um, one of the questions we did want to ask you is, what do you think are your unique qualifications to serve District 10 in Congress? You talked about your background as an educator and as an attorney, but is there something else that makes you uniquely qualified, a very good fit to this widely uncompact district that spreads from Austin clear across to Houston? Surely. I, I think my my career of public service is a big part of that. My experience working with community groups, uh, working with organizations horizontally instead of vertically. So I think that's the type of approach I would bring to the office of representative. The idea that I'm not just going to be in my office waiting for people to call me, but I'm going to go out across the 10th Congressional District to LaGrange, to Cypress, to Austin, and, and everywhere else. And 
essentially hold town halls, hold forums to allow people to get directly engaged in, in governance and to state their priorities and what they would like to see. Um, the current incumbent has not held a town hall in nine years or more, as far as I can tell. Uh, there was one virtual town hall where you could log in online, but you couldn't actually speak. And to me, that's completely contrary to what the system's supposed to be. You're supposed to be able to contact your congressional office, express your concerns, and at least have an ear, if not uh, an accepting uh, person at the other end. Well, in these town hall meetings, what do you think your constituents are going to flag as being of extreme importance? Well, it's interesting. Um, this district almost, ha almost has three distinct regions. You've got Austin and Travis County. You've got Cypress, Katy, you know, and the Harris County part of the district. And then you have seven largely rural counties in between. And so I think there are different sets of priorities. Over here, uh, we, we hear a lot of talk about infrastructure, the need to spend money on things like flood control, you know, reinforce the attics and Barker dams, things of that nature. Uh, in LaGrange, there's more concern about rural hospitals and health care, and also finding more opportunities for employment. I see. And Austin, uh, immigration is, is one of the biggest issues because we've suffered retaliatory immigration raids uh, led by the Republican Party based on our local officials' decision to provide some protection for immigrant families. Tell me about your position on immigration, DACA, and um, protected status that seems to be going away for certain groups. Talk about that. Sure, and my position is, is informed by the role I've played for the city of Austin. I've been the lead attorney for the city of Austin suing the governor in the state of Texas about Senate Bill 4, which was this anti-immigrant law that was passed last year. And through that, I've gotten to work with a lot of wonderful immigrant rights activists. But on the DREAM Act, to me, that's a no-brainer. The idea that these young people were brought here through no decision of their own, who are completely productive and active citizens or active members of our community, they should have legal status and a path to citizenship. Fundamentally, I believe that families should be able to stay together. I mean, there used to be this the party that said that they're about family values. But right now, under the federal government's travel ban, a grandparent can't visit his or her grandkids. And so if we can't take care of our elders, what kind of family values do we have? And so to me, I would like to see similar protections for families to unite here. And also, I, we need to address the backlog of visa and, and green card applications, which in some cases is 10 or 20 years or more. And so we need to completely reform the immigration system. So you see it as an overall overarching piece of work and something like the DREAM Act is a quick patch? Don't let me put words in your mouth. Tell me. Well, the DREAM Act is something that's pending, unfortunately, because the president revoked deferred action for childhood arrivals. So we need to resolve the status of these young people immediately because we have over a million people whose lives are completely in doubt. Um, How many in your district, in your prospective district? Tens of thousands. Uh, there's many at the University of Texas, uh, in Prairie View A&M, uh, working for a lot of companies th across the district. I mean, Texas is hugely impacted by this DACA decision. Um, but yeah, we need to address the overall fundamental breakdown of the immigration system. And interestingly enough, there were many moderate Republicans who were willing to make a deal of this nature under President Obama. Mm -hmm. And it was the, the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party that blew that deal up. So I'm optimistic that we can get back to the table. Okay, let me, in the final few minutes, let me ask you what you want your prospective constituents to know most about you. This is your elevator speech. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Well, I think, first of all, it's that I will fight for working people, for families, for children, for students, for seniors. Uh, my campaign is running from the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party, so I stand for health care for all, fair immigration policies, repealing the recent tax cuts, which set up uh, huge cuts to governmental programs. I want a free and open internet. I want environmental protection, uh, you know, all the standard Democratic Party platform. And then what I bring, which might distinguish me from other candidates, is kind of a community-based organizing perspective. Uh, my campaign is really going to have a strong field operation. We've already been knocking on doors in LaGrange, Cypress, Austin, mm -hmm. and other areas. And so my commitment, if I can win the primary, is to go across the 10th district in a way that hasn't been done since it was gerrymandered and to mobilize hundreds upon hundreds of volunteers. We're going to knock on everyone's door and provide a choice. Do you identify with this president and the decisions the president's making? Or would you prefer a candidate who's going to fight for your health care, fight for your public education? fight for the basic necessities of life. Interesting. I want to ask one more question. 
very quickly, because this is the League of Women Voters, and we'll ask you about voting rights and the process of voting. Is there one thing that Texas should do to make voting more accessible, easier for everybody? I think the clearest thing I can come up with is that there should be a national holiday, or if we're talking about Texas, a state holiday on Election Day. I mean, the right to vote is the fundamental right in a democratic society. And the idea that if you're a poor working person who can't take the day off, you can't go vote, is completely undemocratic. So that should be a paid holiday for everyone in Texas so we can all exercise our democratic duty. That should be a paid weekday holiday? That, that part uh, I'm agnostic on, but it, it should definitely You're be... drilling too far down into the weeds. I mean, to me, <laughs> as long as everyone has an equal opportunity to vote, regardless of your income level, regardless of your employment status, that's most important. You think that would boost participation? It would be fantastic, yes. We, should, we could also do away with the voter ID law, which is anti-democratic as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Mr. Siegel. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome back to Conversations with the Candidates on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Linda Cohn with the League of Women Voters, and this evening we are talking with candidates for Congressional District 10. All candidates were invited to appear. Three have agreed to come, and we're going to have an in-depth chat with each of them, one-on-one. -on -one. Our next guest is Tawana Walter-Kadian, running as a Democrat in the primary for Congressional District 10. Welcome. Welcome, thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What's the most important thing for people to know about your background, and how does that reflect on your ability to govern out of Washington? The most important thing uh, for people to know is that I have a professional as well as personal history of serving my community uh, as a case manager for the Texas Health Steps program, as well as a registered nurse uh, educator. So I have been out in the field dealing with real life situations for American citizens. And you're going to build on this. Absolutely. During your term in Congress. Absolutely. How, absolutely. Are you going to take a special interest in health care, a special interest in education? Absolutely. How is this going to play out? Well, I, let me say this. It is because of health care that I began my run for Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2012, after moving from Jefferson County, where I was very active, one of the first things I did is uh, researched and made a call to the Harris County Democratic Party to see who my representative was. And when researching my representative, I saw that he was voting against health care. As a registered nurse educator, that did not sit well with me. Uh, at the time, I was working for the Julie Rogers Gift of Life out of Beaumont, Texas, and we were providing free mammograms and prostate screenings to citizens with little to no insurance. And at the time, Texas had the highest number of uninsured citizens. Mm -hmm. What year was this? This was 2012, yes. 
So I saw my representative voting against health care, and it was not because of just concern for the citizens. It was because of a partisan disagreement. I know that it is imperative that American citizens have representatives that represent all of the constituents within mm -hmm. their districts and across the country. So for me, uh, I thought that it was time that someone stepped up to say this is not how representatives are to represent us. And so I stuck my neck out and began traveling between Houston and Austin, uh, just speaking with citizens on all sides about what their rights as American citizens are. And health care is vital if you are ill. It's, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter where you live. If you don't have proper health care, you cannot survive. A sick America cannot thrive. Mm. Tell me, is this your first run for office? It is not my first run Tell for us. office. Something that is, that is really wonderful is that because I have been in the field since 2012, and every two years there's a term, we have begun to now, because of my efforts in talking to people, just simply stating facts and giving them the information that they need, um, I have been able to reduce the margin from a 12-point deficit to a six-point deficit. Uh, today's uh, society, you see everyone is very much so engaged because we are realizing as Americans as a whole now that the decisions made in the United States Congress affect us all. When decisions to cut Medicaid are done, it is not done to just hurt Democrats are done to just hurt Republicans, but it hurts every disabled child, regardless of their parents' affiliation. It hurts every elderly American citizen that is in skilled nursing facilities. It hurts every poor American. Americans are now understanding more that it's not the president's office, it's the United States Congress that is enacting bills that are gonna directly impact their lives, whether positively mm -hmm. or negatively. Do you have a special gift, do you think, for working with people whose opinions may not exactly match your own, but there is a possibility to work together? Absolutely, absolutely, and I, and I can accredit that to my mother. Um, we just, my mother just passed away oh. three weeks ago. We just buried her a week ago. But one thing that I can just forever, forever love her for is that she taught us to care for everyone. She mm -hmm. taught us to love everyone. She taught us to engage with everyone. And she did not only do that by words, but by her actions. I will never forget uh, being in elementary school and there was a young girl uh, whose family was poor, and it was obvious in, in her dress and the realities of children going to school without water in their homes, the smell. And I remember my mother dropping me at school one day, and she said, you see that little girl over there? Make sure that you're her friend. So I learned that from my mom. And uh, I think that it's just important sometimes uh, we are intentionally divided. Sometimes people put things in our, in our paths intentionally to divide us. They don't even want us to have an opportunity to sit at the same table because if we ever sit down at the same table, we will realize, oh my goodness, we have more in common than you think. You know, that, that mom that is not on the Democratic ticket but is on the Republican ticket or that person who's never voted again, by eight o'clock in the morning, she and I have the same issues. We have just been running around trying to get kids out in time, trying to get breakfast, handing out school. We have the same things going on in our life. So I think if people stop to just spend a little time together, we'll realize that we not only have a lot of the same similarities, but we have the same concerns. Mm -hmm. And then we can work together to come up with solutions together. Did your mother encourage you to study the healing arts? She did. <laughs> she absolutely did. And, and I will tell you, my plans, because I loved, I loved theater. I and I thought that I was going to go straight to Hollywood after graduating. And my mother said, I tell you what. Tell me again, what school did you go to? Uh, for high school? 
for high school and high for school, university? Westbrook High School in Beaumont, Texas. Okay. And I graduated from Prairie View a &M Prairie. College of Nursing, okay. as well as uh, the Barbara Judd and Mickey Leland School of Public Affairs at Texas Southern University. Yes. Okay, and, and your mother kind of gave you a gentle nudge in that direction. She, she said, you know, go on and get your nursing degree first, and then you can go to Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mothers everywhere would understand that, I'm sure. Yes. As was the case with our previous candidate, I'm going to ask you the mm -hmm. saddest question possible. Okay. It's not even a question, it's a topic, mm -hmm. Florida. Mm. How can you, as a congresswoman representing Texas District 10, work to promote gun safety? Well, I'll tell you, the, the irony about this, and we brought up my mom, the night of January 27th when she passed away, about 45 minutes before my mother passed away, I was on the phone with a, a soon-to-be constituent who wanted to share with me, her name is Christina Woods, she wanted to share with me a gun reform act that she'd already drafted. We'd spoken on the phone maybe about an hour and, and, you know, I hung up, I said, I gotta go check on mom and get her meds. That was January 27th. Of course, everything happened with my mother then, but last week, when I heard the news, Christina Woods is the first person that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. I said, this is what we were just talking about. It is time out for Americans to be divided on the need for gun reform. One way or another, we are going to have to talk together on both sides or however many sides there are, and we need to come up with whatever plan necessary to make sure that our children are not afraid to go to school, to make sure that our children are not murdered in their schools, that thousands of children are not now walking around with post-traumatic stress syndrome because of what has occurred over the last several years due to gun violence in the schools. We, I am very open to speaking with everyone. I am in Texas and I grew up with guns. I grew up with a father and a grandfather, grandfathers that hunted. So guns for a child in the rural area, they are the norm. A lot of people living in the city in Houston, Texas, or even in Austin, Texas, they came from the country it's very, it's, it's the norm. It's, it's just like having a, a mug of coffee for them. And the propaganda that has gone out before them is that they want to take your guns. And that's not true. That is absol absolutely not true. It is not about confiscating guns. It is about public safety. And we have to face reality, reality and be sensible and think, is it really necessary for American citizens to have access, an 18-year-old to have access to a military rifle. Is there a mental health component to all of this? There is a mental health component to it. There is a federal responsibility component to it. I don't think that we should have to make it harder than it is to propose gun control uh, as much as we may hate to admit it, uh, corporations and organizations have a huge influence on the decisions made in the United States Congress and the United States Senate. Uh, when you have representatives who are afraid to stand up for what is right, despite the fact that it may even be their state where children were gunned down, they are afraid to do what is right, to even talk about gun reform because they have been supported by an organization such as the NRA, then I think it's time for us to just reconsider our real motives for being in these seats. If our real motives are to represent people and our children, our children are our future, they are our future. If they don't see us truly trying to protect them on every hand, then what are we doing to ourselves for the future? We're, we're basically cutting our own future off. They need to see us fighting for them now so that we will be able to see them fighting for us later. 
Do you think that a representative in the halls of Congress has a duty to convey the opinions of her district, or does she have a duty to use her own best judgment? I think that a representative has the duty to take the information from the constituents as well as rely on their best judgment, but you cannot shut off constituents. You know, with our congressman, there have been many town halls that he has not appeared in. I've appeared at two of the town halls where he has not shown up. And what you're saying to your constituents, because in these town hall meetings are people from both sides. And then that, when I say both sides, it's just because the Republican and Democratic Party are the largest, but there are other people who are independent. And he did not show up. There were several held, and I went to two of them. So you are saying to us, because even right now I am a constituent, you are saying to us that our opinions don't matter. And you cannot, even in a family, in a family, in a workplace, you can't really accomplish great goals, the best goals, if everyone is not a part of the decision making. Tell process. us a little bit, tell us just a little bit about immigration reform. Uh, immigration reform, I tell you, I have heard uh, some horrific stories. I think that it is imperative that we do create a clear pathway to citizenship. The reality is, and unfortunately a lot of people don't realize, is that America is founded on immigrants. I don't know many people that live here, unless they are a Native American, that can say, my family originated here. Um, we have to look at all the talk about immigration and, and, and repealing DACA and sending people back to homes in which they've never known. What is the root of it? If we go back and look at the Immigration Act of 1924, um, that particular act came about because you had white supremacists holding a march in Washington, D.C., saying that they did not want non-whites being allowed to come into the United States. And thus, at that time, the Immigration Act of 1924 was instituted, and the, the proposition was that for whoever was here, if you were here for, from Greece, that from that point on, if it was 90 of you from Greece, the only people allowed in would be another 2%. That is what the stipulation was. But again, the root cause of it was not good. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what is happening here. We have immigrants that have been contributors to society, great contributors to society, and now families are being ripped apart People are hiding. People are afraid here in America, which is a nation of immigrants. Okay, have about a minute. Okay. Is there something that is absolutely urgent for your constituents to know about you? Well, something we haven't talked about. I, I want the constituents to know that in me, you will have a fighter. You will have someone that will fight for all people. I do believe that it is imperative that we have people in Congress that have actually dealt with human beings. And when I say that, if you have never touched the face of Medicaid, if you never touched the face of the disabled, you've never touched Medicare, you've never sat and talked to the student who's afraid, it would be very easy to say, we're gonna cut this and we're gonna cut that and we're gonna cut this because you don't understand the repercussions. In me, you will have someone that understands the real needs of the citizens and I will fight and advocate for all citizens. Thank you so much, Ms. Thank Katie. You. And we're very glad you were able Thank to you. join us this evening. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Hello, and welcome back to Conversations with the Candidates on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Linda Cohn with the League of Women Voters, and this evening we are having a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations with candidates who are running for the 10th Congressional District. With me right now is Tammy Walker, a Democrat. Welcome, Tammy. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I'm an attorney here in Katy. Um, I have 28 years of, uh, of experience working in different industries related to energy and infrastructure. So my professional background is working um, as a, either a general counsel or in-house counsel for companies like telecommunications, wind farm development. Um, I worked for a gas transmission company and engineering company. So that's my professional background. Yeah, what about your, your schooling? Where did you go to school? Where were you brought up? I, um, I, was, I was raised, I was born in Shamrock, Texas and raised there. And, uh, and then I went to uh, Southwestern Oklahoma State University and I got a, an accounting degree. And then I went on to law school at the University of Texas. And I've lived in both Austin and Houston. I lived in Austin for a total of 18 years and in the Houston area for about 14. Which is interesting because your district spans <laughs> Austin is. to Houston. So no place is, is, is strange to you. Right. Tell me a little bit about um, what you've done um, with environmental work. Um, well, um, I've worked for, my first job uh, was with a, uh, was with a gas transmission company, so I was involved in projects related to acquiring right of way, and so uh, I have been involved in getting appropriate permits for that sort of uh, activity and working mm -hmm. with the Environmental Protection Agency, and um, and that's also true for uh, for for wind farm development. It's mostly been in a compliance role in different regulatory frameworks. Okay, do you think your experience? brings anything to the table in Washington when it comes to environmental issues? Yes, I do. Uh, I really think that my, uh, my background has given me uh, a pretty deep knowledge of, of kind of how things work in different industries, um, both in oil and gas and also in, in, in um, electric energy and in telecommunications. And I think all of that experience is, and that knowledge of how things work will serve me very well in working on projects related to climate change. And, um, and I hope to, to one day work on like the infrastructure committee uh, so that I could be involved in working on a real, uh, an infrastructure plan that would really truly help the citizens of the country. I see, tell us a bit about the voting process. The voting process. When we uh, sent out our voters guide questions and we asked what are the three most important things you'd like to address during your oh. term in Congress, we have <laughs> voter suppression. Voter suppression, yes, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I feel very strongly that one of the main problems in uh, Congress right now is, is uh, too much money in politics and also voter suppression and gerrymandering. It's really resulting, resulted in taking power from the people. And so uh, I really hope to uh, bring, bring common sense back to that. And I think that we need an amendment to the Voter Rights Act to, uh, to address things like uh, the gerrymandering that we see in this district and, um, and provide, I think that the federal government could provide more oversight to make to ensure that there's not uh, racial gerrymandering and suppression of different racial groups. Is is gerrymandering a form of voter suppression in your opinion? In my opinion, it is. Could you it's help us follow? Serious. Could you help us follow the dots on that? Uh, well, the the districts are well. You see it if you look at this district um, and you look at Austin. It's kind of split into a pie. And it has five congressional districts, even though it's a it's it's a major city, and it, so it so it it really only has one Democratic um, uh, Congressperson. Or right now, the district is only 
there's only one de Democrat, Democratic congressperson. So those other five districts are, are split and they go out into these areas that are more red, more controlled by Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so it really uh, dilutes the vote that they have there. Okay. What about the voting process itself? Is there voter suppression built into the voting process? Voter ID, for example. Yes, uh, Texas has one of the the, the worst uh, or the the, the most um, difficult voter ID processes, um, and I think that it's really resulted in a lot of people uh, losing their voice again, and um, you know. We have we have a situation where it's it's difficult in some for some people to obtain an ID, and um, and in, you know in other states there's automatic voter registration when you get an ID or when you get a uh, when you get a driver's license. I would like to see more of that. There's a long period of time before the election where it's too late to to uh, register to vote. So you could in some states again you have the same day voter registration. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we also routinely kind of sweep people out of the voter registration system who haven't voted in a few, you know, in a few mm -hmm. cycles. So there are several things that Texas is doing to really suppress the vote. How would you remedy that? Is federal legislation required? I really think that there's a lot of room for, uh, for federal legislation. It would be amendment to the 1964 Voter Rights Act. And it would provide that oversight that I was talking about and also set some basic guidelines about what can be done. Okay. Tell us about Florida. Tell us, Tell us about Florida. Florida. Oh, Florida. The terrible oh. tragedies that have unfolded. Yes. Um, I, I'm a member of Moms Demand Action. Um, I think that we need... Uh, real change. I mean, it, it's been very frustrating to just to see the lack of action uh, from Congress on this issue because I think that there are a lot of kind of inc uh, s changes that can be made that are actually um, most people are in agreement on in a bipartisan way, but they can't you know can't get it through partly because of the NRA and how 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 much money they're they're donating to the candidates, but. Um, I think that um, I think that we need to uh, st we would we should start I think with repealing the Dickey Amendment, which uh, provides that the CDC can't even study the issue. So um, you know, thirty three thousand people a year are killed with guns, but we can't even put federal money towards studying the issue. So. That I think needs to change, and then I think we need to find the common areas where people agree. Uh, there seems to be agreement that uh, background checks, universal background checks, and stronger background checks should be uh, could could probably you know be passed. Um, um, I think most people agree that people on the terrorist watch list should not be able to obtain guns. Um, the bump stocks, the thirty. Mag 30 round magazines clips uh, or 30 round magazines. I think we could almost immediately uh, outlaw. But I think I think we also need to look at um, banning these semi-automatic rifles uh, as well. The air, you know, because they seem to be cause you know be used in a lot of these types of uh, tragedies. Are these things best addressed through federal legislation? Well, I think it creates a much more uniform system um, mm -hmm. if you establish at least minimum standards uh, at the federal level. Um, otherwise, I think people would just obtain guns in one state and, and use them in another state. I think there's also room to uh, raise, the, raise the age limit to acquire a gun, uh, a weapon. And, you know, another thing is a wait list. People can walk into a store right now and walk out with one of these rifles, and I think that's a huge problem. Mm. Tell me what you think about immigration reform. Immigration reform. Specifically the dreamers. Start with the dreamers? Start with the dreamers. Okay, yes. Um, well, the dreamers, in my mind, are, um, it's very clear that we need to, uh, to pass the DREAM Act 
in my opinion, these kids have been made promises. They followed the rules, and um, and they're they've been vetted. They're exactly the kind of young people we should want to have in the United States. Most of them have jobs. Most of them are well educated, and um, and they've paid the fees. They've had the background checks, and we need to pass that. And I think we also need uh, to to have a compassionate, um, compassionate laws where we keep families together. Mm -hmm. um, we, we do allow people who are um, refugees into the country. Uh, this is a country, you know, established by immigrants and um, I think we need to continue that tradition. I also think we need to look at uh, areas where there are job shortages and offer more temporary visas. Um, for example, in Houston, there's a labor shortage related to uh, construction, and with all of the, the flooding that's happened, uh, people can't get work crews. So I think that we should make those, those types of visas easier to get, and, and then also uh, have reform to make sure those tr people are treated um, with respect and uh, have wage protections and safety protections. Okay. Let me ask you, too about another topic. Okay. Healthcare. Healthcare. You like single payer. Yes. Uh, I think that uh, single payer is a much more efficient system. Um, you know, r right now with our current systems, we, we're spending a lot of money on overhead. And so uh, b the overhead of insurance companies. And so if you kind of took that overhead out and, and just expanded Medicare to cover everyone, uh, I think it would create a lot of efficiencies. And, you know, I understand that that may not happen easily and you may have to phase it in or have a two-tier mm -hmm. system for a while, but I think that ultimately that's the, the best way to go. Okay. In our remaining time, would you like to talk a little bit about what we need to know about <laughs> you in order to make our decision on Election Day? Okay. Um, I think I do kind of bring a unique perspective in that I have lived in rural Texas, Austin, and Houston. And, uh, and I've spent my entire uh, life in Texas. And so I think that I think that's important to understand the needs of the, of the citizens of this district. I also think that with my background um, in, in, in business, and I, you know, I've negotiated huge deals with a lot of moving parts. And I think that what I bring to the table is an ability to, um, to find consensus and negotiate and find win-win, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, places where we can come to an agreement. And I would, um, I would commit to the people of this district to really try to work across the aisle to find solutions that, that work. And um, so I think all of that is, is really important. I'm also a mother, and I think that that kind of brings a different perspective um, to the table. So. Okay. This has um, been very nice speaking with you, Thank you this evening. I'm going to take some time now at the end of our telecast to talk about the election and two things everybody needs to be aware of. If you found out that your voter registration certificate is notated with the word suspense, don't panic. Suspense is the worst word in the Texas election code. When election wonks see the word suspense, they figure, they shrug their shoulders and figure out ah, another piece of paperwork. When a normal person sees the word suspense, they think they're being sent to the principal's office and they've done something terribly wrong and they can't vote. No. If your voter registration card, if when you go to the polling place, you, you see a note, your name is on the poll book, you see a note that says suspense, you can vote. All that means is that the registrar of voters needs to confirm your address. It's easy to do. It's a simple statement of residence form, and then you go ahead and you vote in the usual fashion. So please be ambassadors of good information to everyone you run into. Suspense does not mean that your right to vote has been 
taken away. It just means that you have to fill out a very benign piece of paperwork. The other thing is voter ID. Texas requires that people who are voting in person, whether it's during the early voting period or on election day, have to present one of seven approved forms of photo ID. Four are provided by the state of Texas and three are provided by the federal government. The state of Texas has your driving license, probably the most important popular way to identify yourself at the polling place. So you have your driver's license, your personal um, identification card, your concealed handgun license. You can also have a special voter ID card that's only good for use at the polls, but it works beautifully if you need to present it at the poll so you can vote. So those are the four that the state of Texas issue. Federal government issues passports, military ID, or your naturalization certificate with a photograph. And if you don't have any of these seven forms of photo ID, don't worry. There's a whole list of additional forms of identification, some with photographs, some without photographs, that you can use so that you will be able to cast a ballot on Election Day. Go ahead, visit the county clerk's website, H, uh, harrisvotes.com. Visit our website, lwvhouston.org. That's my civic engagement pep talk for this evening, and we hope that all your civic engagement adventures will be enjoyable, profitable, and that you'll leave a legacy to the next generation. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. My name is Linda Cohn with the League of Women Voters. Again, our website for reliable, impartial information is www.lwvhouston.org. Thanks so much. Good evening.